when we had a meeting, they, they come here once a month or so, and these young men have their Boy Scout time. Uh, on an, another occasion, at one of their ceremonies, they had me speak, asked me to speak for them. And I related at that time a story about my involvement in Boy Scouts, which was this long. I went to three meetings. And when I tell the story, I'm reminding you of something that I gave you. I went to about three meetings, and it was pretty cool because we had an old log cabin that we met in. And being a new one, they put me off with some other new ones, and we sat in a room, and for those three meetings, part of that meeting time was learning to tie knots. And I thought, this is going to be pretty fun, good way to start, and I'll be all right. At the fourth meeting, things changed. The scoutmaster said, now in about a month, we're going to do our first outing. And the first outing is a canoe trip. We're going to get you out in the river. And we're going to turn your canoe over. And you're going to learn to get to the shore with the canoe up over your heads. My time in Boy Scouts was this long. I said, no, if you turn me over, somebody else gets the canoe. I'll just be concerned about me. Well, I didn't want to be in the midst of turning over a canoe, so my Boy Scout career ended. And I closed that devotional time with these young men and said, you know, some Monday night when you're here, I need to come back up and have you show me again how to do those knots because I've needed them many times and I've forgotten how to do it. So I'm going to be an honorary Boy Scout for a little bit just to learn to tie a few knots because sometimes I tie knots that I can't untie and I would like to be able to untie. So I need knots that I can tie, they will be secure, but when I want them, I don't have to have pliers to get them across or I don't have to have a knife to cut the knot off. So that's what's going to happen. But since today is Boy Scout Honoring Sunday, the concepts of the scouting life certainly are to be admired. Now, I don't know the oath very well. I looked it up. I don't even remember learning it as a kid. But a number of things that we find in that scouting oath, and I see some of you are already quoting it in your heads. Well, you, you can do it for me because I don't know how to do it. But I think it is that on my honor, here's the part I like, I'll do my best. We're going to look about that. I'll do my best. And notice the things that they include in that. To do my duty to God and, and country. To obey the scout law, yes. Then they say, and I will help others at all times. Well, certainly Christianity is about that, right? being physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. The scout oath sounds a whole lot like Christian living. And as I was thinking about that, I thought about this text in Luke 2 just read. And I asked myself this question, is it possible that those who formulated the scout oath actually took it from this experience of Jesus? He's the right age, 12 years old. And everything that the scout oath said is right here in this text. And the idea is, I will do my best. So for a few minutes, think with me if you will, this idea I will do my best. 
Let's look to the example of Jesus in this text, if you have your Bibles open there, to this text in Luke 2, and follow with me as we notice three things that I think Jesus did that I should say, I will do my best to do that as well. Here's number one. I will do my best to listen. To listen. The text says of Jesus that when they found him in the temple, verse 46, he was there amongst those teachers listening and asking questions. I think one of the greatest traits that anyone can possess is to learn to listen well. You know what? Jesus said nine times in Scripture, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What's the point? Jesus was being very clear. You should listen. There Jesus was in the midst of all of these great leaders as a Jewish man, and he was listening to them. There are all kinds of ways in which we should listen. We listen to those we love. We listen to those we respect because I want to hear what they have to say. But do we listen to those with whom we disagree? Who was Jesus listening to? Were these leaders of the Jewish people the ones who were following the law God gave as they should? Well, we find out through Scripture, nope, not really. But what was Jesus doing? Listening anyway. Well, certainly. We should listen in our families. Now, maybe we don't do it as well as we should. Maybe we need to learn to listen more. We, we know that somebody's talking, but are we really listening to them? Yeah, we probably need to do better. And we go to class, and we're in school, and we have these professors, and we listen. We know that they're talking. We know we have a test coming, and so we're trying to gather the information so we can pass a test. But are we really listening but what about people with whom you disagree? Do you take time to listen to them? I think it is imperative upon us who claim as New Testament Christians to be doing what God wants us to do. We need to listen to those with whom we disagree. Have you ever thought about how the golden rule applies to listening. The golden rule says what? Do to others as you would have them do to you. How does that fit listening? You know, isn't it amazing how selfish we are in so many areas of life? We expect things of others that we don't expect of ourselves. And if somebody's not listening to us, we want to, hey, 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 tune in here. Listen to me. But what about when someone else is talking? Are you tuned in? Do you listen? Do to others as you would have them do to you. Listening is a whole lot about the golden rule. How do we learn to listen? If I say, I will do my best to listen. If today you decide after leaving this time together, okay, I need to do better. In fact, I'm going to do my best and I'm going to listen. What do you need to do? Number one, you need to respect the person who is talking. Respect. It is simple respect to say, when someone else is talking, I'm not. 
It's very difficult to listen when you're talking. It is very difficult to hear what the other person is saying when you're talking over them. So if you respect the fact that they are humans like you and you want them to treat you this way, then I'm going to respect you. Number two, I'm going to focus on what you are saying. Focus. I'm afraid that a lot of times, here is how we listen. This other person is talking, and I'm thinking. I'm all just waiting for that person to take a breath so I can jump in with my prepared speech. And it may not have anything at all to do what this person was just saying. But this is what I want to say. If any of you are watching these political debates, don't you see that happening all the time? They ask a question. And the person makes some vague comment about the question and then launches into this speech they'd already decided to give and it may not have a single thing at all to do with the question that was asked. They're not focusing. You got to focus. Number three, internalize. Take it in. And what it means to internalize, I think, is this. You take what the other person is saying and you put it inside of you and you combine what they are saying with what you are going to say. So that what you now say actually fits what they've just been talking about. And then you respond. That's what the response is. Now, particularly... For our thoughts this morning, think about Jesus. What does the text say he did? He was listening to them and asking questions. Now, I think it is obvious that what he was doing, he was listening to the things that they were saying, and then he asked questions about the things they said. And you might think, well, that just makes sense. But we don't do that sometimes. You know why? Because we're not prepared enough to respond properly to someone with whom we disagree. And therefore, we just give a canned speech. I'm going to tell you, it is my belief that if we decide I'm going to do my best to listen, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my learning and my preparation and after they say something, I'm going to respond in a way that matches what they are talking about. Because when I disagree with someone about what Scripture teaches, it's just not going to work if I just pick up my Bible and slap them across the face with it. It just doesn't work. The only way to handle that disagreement is to listen and then apply Scripture as you understand it and have a back and forth. I will do my best to listen. Number two. I will do my best to learn. Look at Jesus in verse 47. These people were astonished at his understanding and his answers. I am going to do my best to learn. The wise man said in Proverbs 18, verse 15, the heart of the prudent acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise man seeks knowledge. 
Peter would say, desire the pure milk of the word that you might grow thereby, 1 Peter 2 and verse number 2. But listen to the greatest oration about a desire to learn. It's found in Psalm 19, starting in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is pure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment or the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, than much fine gold. And in keeping them, there is great reward. May I ask you a question? You be honest with yourself. Is your motivation for being here this morning to punch a clock or to make a check that you were here? Or with respect to this part of our lesson, are you motivated to be here to learn and desire to learn, is that what drives you here partially? Or just checking a box so you feel better about the way you used a Sunday morning? We should desire the Word of God. If you're going to learn, you have to desire it. Number two, you have to hold on to it when you get it. To those men who would serve as shepherds in the congregations, Paul wrote to Titus in chapter 1 in verse 9, holding fast to the word of God that they may be able to convict those who oppose themselves. Hold fast. You know what that word means? It means you get a grip on it as strongly as you can as though you are about to fall off a cliff and you're holding on to the only thing that will keep you from falling. You hold fast. Do you want to learn? You better hold fast to it. Number three, if you want to do your best to learn, then you will be unashamed to announce to everybody, I believe in the Word of God. Paul wrote in Romans 1 and verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Where's the power of God to salvation? To everyone who believes, first to the Jews, then also to the Gentiles. If you leave today and you say, I'm going to do my best to learn, then you work on your desire. And when you find it, you work on holding on to it. And as you're holding on to it, you announce it to everyone so they know where you stand in your attitude about it. Then you can say, I'm doing my best to learn. Number three, I will do my best to live. The text continues in verses 51 and 52 in a very famous passage. I want you to look at some words. Number one, 
Look at the verse 30, uh, 52, the first word that I want to focus on. Jesus increased. Increased. I looked up what that word means. Found it to be rather interesting. When it says that Jesus increased in these ways, the word that is used there is a word that was used for a pioneer who was the first one to enter into the wilderness. And while he's going, he's cutting his way through to get to the other side. Isn't that fascinating? I think I know what he's trying to say. What we're about to say about living, not easy. You're going to have to cut through a lot of stuff. You're going to have to push your way through. You're going to have to put effort behind it. You don't just glide along. Been in an airport where they have those moving sidewalks. Those things are cool, right? Because you're going this way, and if you can stand there, you'll be moving, and it's fine. But if you really want to have fun, walk. Walk fast while the sidewalk is moving. And buddy, you're just breezing by people. And it makes you think, whoa, I'm an Olympic runner. <laughs> and then if you really want to have fun, run on one of those things. Now, if you can stand up without falling, you're pretty good. You ought to be an Olympic runner. But how smooth is that? That's not life. Life is more like trying to drive a car at rush hour in New York City. That's life. He increased. He cut his way through, did Jesus. And that's what we do in trying to live as God would have us live. And then he mentions four ways. Verse 52, Jesus increased in wisdom. Mentally, he increased. Mentally, he was better. By the truth, get understanding. Proverbs 4 and 5. Proverbs 23 and 23. Get wisdom. Do not sell it. Increase mentally. Jesus increased mentally. He grew. He increased. He pushed through. Sounds to me like a college class in physics. I couldn't do it. But you push through if you have to. Mental work. It's a lot, easy, a lot easier in life just to veg out and do nothing. It's tough to study, to push, to cut your way through, to improve mentally. He increased in wisdom. He increased in stature. He increased physically, physically. I think it's okay in a right way to brag about your family. March the 1st, mom and dad will be going to Guyana, South America again. They are 81 years old. For three weeks, they're going to troop around the jungles in Guyana and sleep in tents. You know one of the reasons they can do that? Because physically, they stay fit. Dad goes and swims four or five days a week at the YMCA. And mom goes down and does the treadmill and the bike and the body recall. Yes, they're blessed with good genetics, but the genetics aren't enough. Physically fit. 
Remember, Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 a bodily exercise profits. Number three, he increased in favor with God spiritually. Spiritually. The rest of that passage, 1 Timothy 4 8, bodily exercise profits, but godliness is profitable in all things. Again, how do you increase spirituality? It's not on a moving sidewalk, it's cutting through the woods. It's getting in and digging out what is there. It is spending time and effort. I will say this unapologetically. If the only spiritual exercise you are getting happens in this setting, you will never be fully pleasing to God. Period. Because this is not cutting through anything. This is the easy part. The hard part comes when you're out there applying what we find here. And finally, Jesus increased socially. Again, the wise men said in Proverbs 22 and 1, a good name is better to be chosen than riches of gold and silver. Socially, we have to cut through the woods because relationships are not easy. The best relationships we have in life themselves are not easy. So you have to cut through and work through so now if you leave today and you say, I will do my best to live as I should, then you just cut through and you work on your mind and you work on your body and you work on your spirituality and you work on your relationships. And I'll close with this one thought from Jesus. When his parents found him, he said, Did you not know I must be about my father's business? Here's what I think he was saying. Didn't you know that I have to do my best? And what's the best that any one of us can do? The business that God asks us to do. Remember, God did his best. He sent the best sacrifice he had on our behalf. Jesus did his best. He gave up all that he had for you and me. The Holy Spirit did his best. He gave us the word, the best word available, accurate and complete. So together, they did their best. Will you not today choose to do your best? The best thing you can do today is leave in a right relationship with God, being obedient, letting us baptize you into Jesus Christ, or leave today your best as a child of God, repenting and telling God, I'm going to do better. Can we help you? If so, will you come as we stand and